Ready? Ready. Okay, uh, the date, what the hell is the date? Dude? This is the September 4th. September 4th, we're in the OBJ Library, and the subject today is uh, Sherwood Markman. Hello, Harry. Okay, yeah, it's up to you. Tell us, start out, Sherwood, by telling how you got uh, involved in the Johnson White House to begin with, and what your duties were, and then go on with Okay, that. well, how I got involved in the White House, I guess depends on who answers that question. There are about three or four strings to that bow, and I'm never quite uh, sure which one is the accurate one. Uh, I had uh, been, uh, uh, when I graduated from the Yale Law School, uh, uh, I had uh, listened to the, to the dean there who said that the purpose of that great law school was not to just fund the, uh, the great law firms of uh, Washington and New York City, but go home, young men. So I went back to where I had been born and raised, which was Iowa. Excuse, excuse me. I okay. All right. Uh, well, Harry, you asked me how I got to, uh, to Washington and how I got to the White House, and uh, that depends on who is answering that question. I've heard three or four different versions. I've never been quite sure which one is true. But uh, my own background is that when I graduated from the Yale Law School, uh, I listened to the uh, dean there uh, who uh, advised uh, the, the members of our very small class to, uh, that they didn't intend to just fund the law, large law firms of New York and Washington, but go home, young men. So I went back to where I'd been born and raised, which was Iowa, and uh, began the practice of uh, law there. Uh, and uh, became quite active in uh, uh, democratic uh, politics. Uh, had become state president of the Young Democrats of Iowa, and uh, generally uh, had uh, uh, I had attended as a delegate uh, the conventions of 1956 and 1960. And uh, in 1960, and this is relevant to answering your question. Uh, I served on Adlai Stevenson's staff and was uh, very much deeply involved in the last gasp effort on behalf of the Stevenson people who were working uh, in alliance with the Lyndon Johnson people to uh, keep uh, John Kennedy from being nominated on the first ballot under the theory, which I think was accurate, uh, that if he didn't win on the first ballot, uh, he wouldn't be nominated. and. Uh, uh, so we were working very hard together, and I was very deeply involved in that. And uh, uh, the contacts I made from the Stevenson staff uh, uh, resulted in uh, uh, Tom Finney, who was Clark Clifford's law partner, who was general counsel in 1964 to the uh, Credentials Committee, which was considering the problem of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Now well, that's a string that I'll come back to. Uh, at the same time, back in Iowa, I had become, uh, I guess you would call it a protege, uh, a young man uh, who was being uh, looked after very closely by our then Governor Harold Hughes, who was later Senator from Iowa. And uh, Governor Hughes uh, uh, was uh, very much a father figure to me, and I helped him in every possible way, including I was his campaign manager back in 1964. And in that, those days, uh, Governor Hughes and Lyndon Johnson were close friends. And um, the 1964 Democratic National Convention was coming up. And uh, as I understood it from Governor Hughes, the president wanted the convention to go perfectly smoothly because the president was greatly concerned if there was any great incident at the convention uh, that disrupted it, it would give an opening to uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, who the president believed was looking for an opening to displace President Johnson and uh, assume the legitimacy of the mantle of the presidential candidacy. Whether true or not, I don't know, but in any event, that was my understanding as conveyed to me by Governor Hughes. Well, coming up uh, from uh, Mississippi at the time was a great problem. Uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic 
party was black and wanted to be seated at the convention. And the president wanted that fight, that desire uh, uh, somehow solved by a compromise that would be acceptable to uh, uh, Joe Rao, who represented the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Walter Ruther, and the uh, northern liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and the southern establishment of the Democratic Party. He didn't know, the president didn't know, according to Hughes, how or what compromise could be reached, but he wanted it done. So, as I understood it from Hughes, uh, the president wanted from Hughes the name of some body that could go to the convention and help work out that compromise. Somebody who was, uh, uh, I guess he was looking for a lawyer. Uh, and uh, Hughes had suggested my name. And that was acceptable and I was instructed to go to the convention and work through Walter Jenkins to try to work out that compromise. And uh, the president had also uh, uh, posed the same question to uh, uh, to, to uh, Senator Humphrey as sort of the price for his being selected as vice president and uh, Humphrey had suggested the then Attorney General of, uh, of, uh, of Minnesota, uh, Walter Mondale. So Fritz and I uh, went to uh, the convention as two of the five uh, people on the a subcommittee of the Credentials Committee charged with the idea of working out a compromise. And uh, Fritz representing Humphrey, and I understood I was representing the President since I was dealing with uh, Jenkins. In any event, uh, without going into all of the details, we did work out a compromise, which surprised and pleased the President. And the convention went smoothly, and uh, both Fritz Mondale and I got our rewards. Fritz's was greater than mine because he took Humphrey's place in the United States Senate. Mine was to get a call from, uh, Wal from Marvin Watson to come to Washington and see the president, and uh, at which time I was uh, uh, asked to come to Washington and uh, help out the administration. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to come. I was very happy in Iowa, pleased with my life there, but uh, as anyone who knows Lyndon Johnson uh, can testify, when he sits there and says, your president needs you, it's virtually impossible to say no. So I didn't say no, and I came. Uh, that's my version of the story. Marvin Watson, however, has a third version of the story, and that is that uh, Cliff Carter, who uh, actually was the president's man on the Democratic National Committee and was an old, old friend of the president's, had seen me try a lawsuit uh, in front of the state senate of Iowa where I had actually caused the Republican majority to uh, turn tail and run. And Carter, uh, this is Marvin's story, was uh, sufficiently impressed that he told uh, uh, Marvin and the president that you got to get this guy and that's how I got there. So that's uh, one of those stories is true, or maybe all of them, as far as I know. In any event, I came uh, and, uh, in, uh, in the spring of 1965. And uh, the, the rest of your question, I forget, was well, what, what did I do then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know anything about Washington, D.C., that's for sure, uh, or the federal government. Um, and uh, I think one of the, the first experiences I had, which uh, was both, uh, was kind of frightening to me, was uh, my friend Nick Cotts, who ultimately won a Pulitzer Prize, called me and said, uh, this is the summer of 1965, and said, do you know that Senator Kennedy, he was then Senator from New York, is about to give uh, a speech uh, uh, really laying it into the president on Vietnam. And that is a real 180 degree change in Kennedy's position. And, I th and he's going to give that speech tomorrow morning, and I thought you'd like to have a heads up on it, because he's already released the advanced text of the speech. Uh, so uh, I thank Nick and uh, uh, saw Marvin and uh, told him that story and uh, 
Marvin saw the president and the uh, uh, came back to me and said, the president wants you to go up to Capitol Hill and uh, convince Pre uh, Kennedy not to give that speech. And I s said, well, but, but Marvin, I said, I said he's already released an, exa uh, an advanced text of it, and uh, if I go up and do that, won't that put our put us in his hands, he can say whatever he wants, and then also add the White House pressured him <laughs> into trying not to give that speech. So uh, I was told uh, to, that they had complete confidence that I could avoid that problem <laughs> successfully. In any event, I trotted up to uh, Capitol Hill, and uh, uh, it was uh, around six or seven o'clock in the evening, and. Uh, uh, went into Kennedy's office and he saw me and I told him that uh, we uh, got word of this speech and wondered if there was any way that uh, uh, we could, uh, uh, I could convince him to moderate it. Uh, and the uh, hook I used actually was that uh, his friend David Bell, who was uh, then director of the Agency for International Development, was going to be on the platform with him and it would be embarrassing to Bell. Uh, not to speak of the reaction of the president. In any event, surprisingly enough, uh, uh, Kennedy was receptive. He called in his two speechwriters, uh, Peter Edelman uh, and Adam Walensky, uh, and uh, there began a negotiation that took uh, a good part of the night, uh, going through that speech line by line, word by word, uh, in the middle of, the, of that negotiation, Kennedy excused himself, went back to his home in Virginia uh, to some party, and then came back. And anyway, at the end of the night, he had actually changed the speech to, uh, to, to take away this stuff uh, that was so objectionable. And I had only one final question of him, and that was, uh, Senator, uh, since the advanced text is so different from the one we've just agreed on exactly, and somebody is bound to ask you about it, exactly what are you going to say as to the reason why you're giving a changed speech? And uh, uh, his answer to me was, I'm going to lie, Mr. Markman. I'm going to say that the only speech that counts is the one I give. And uh, uh, the next day I managed to be there when he gave the speech. He gave it exactly as we'd agreed to. And then afterwards, I happened to be close enough to hear the press ask him that question, and he gave exactly the answer he told me he would give, uh, which was uh, my introduction into the affairs of state at the White House. After that, uh, I continued on uh, in my little office up on the second floor of the West Wing, and uh, the president sometimes called me his utility infielder because uh, uh, he finally came to the conclusion that I could uh, more or less uh, handle things, uh, whether I was competent to or trained to or not, and I'd be given whatever job happened to be at hand. Uh, looking at you, Harry, I uh, uh, remember uh, my one and only and thankfully last experience as a speechwriter. Uh, for some reason, he got the idea that I could write. And uh, we were flying somewhere or another on Air Force One, and um, whatever you guys had prepared for him for that speech, he decided on the airplane he didn't like. And uh, so he uh, comes up to me and says, Markman, I hear you can write. He says, here, I want you to change this speech, uh, and I want this, that, and the other thing in it, and uh, you get, go ahead and uh, rewrite it right now, and, uh, and just have it, ready to me when, have it ready for me when we land. So I take the speech and get on one of our, the typewriters on the airplane, and uh, you've probably had this experience, but here I am trying to rewrite it, and Lyndon Johnson is standing over my shoulder, watching me word for word as I try to prepare it, <laughs> making comments and suggestions all the way. Well, needless to say, when we landed, it was a dedication of a dam or something. Uh, uh, the speech wasn't ready. So he went off to the dedication. I'm still on the airplane typing away. So he left a p police escort <laughs> for me in the speech. And fortunately, I arrived at the uh, place of the speech with the, uh, with the draft in tow, just in time to hand it to him before he gave it. And uh, 
he hadn't had a chance to read it <laughs> except when he gave it. And believe me, after that, I appreciated what guys like you were doing and never wanted any part of it again. Uh, but I did many, many things. I think the thing that, that I'm proudest of, that maybe I had, uh, where I really feel that I had some impact on things was uh, one Christmas time when he asked me into the office and said, uh, I've decided I want to have somebody like you go into the uh, black ghettos of the United States and find out what's happening. I want to know what this black power business means. I want to know what programs are working and what programs aren't working and uh, I want to know who the good people are and who aren't and uh, so I decided that uh, somebody like you ought to do that and I said well, well Mr. President you know how am I supposed to do this I mean I'm white I'm from Iowa I don't know anything about inner city problems and that's exactly why I ask you to do this because I want to have a, a completely uh, uh, unsullied view of what happened and I said well how am I supposed to do this? He says well you're a bright boy I think you can figure that out so uh, uh, I went back and once again I called on my dear friend Nick Kotz uh, I was in with the Washington Post I think and uh, confide with him off the record because the president also added he didn't want me to get in trouble or get my name in the newspapers or uh, anything like that and uh, I, I had decided that the only way I could do this is to find somebody who was black who could keep his mouth shut and who could keep me out of trouble and show me around so we found uh, Nick had this friend of his who had been born and raised in the Chicago ghetto which was the place we decided to go to and uh, uh, named Ken Vallis. So Kenny, uh, he introduced me to Kenny and I liked Kenny and so Kenny and I went into uh, first the south side of Chicago and then uh, the west side of Chicago. It was the middle of winter, it was cold. We lived in rooming houses. Uh, we walked the streets at night. Uh, we uh, stayed there for 10 days to two weeks and I came back full of so many reactions and feelings and thoughts I couldn't contain myself and uh, so I wrote my report to the president which I knew he wanted one page reports but I couldn't stop and it ended up I forget what the length of it but it's something like 10 or 15 single space pages long but I set it in figuring he's just going to just rip it rip me up for it and uh, as it turned out, he liked it. And uh, uh, it also turned out that uh, I found out at least one of the reasons he wanted the reports because I was, several times I would be sitting uh, in a meeting with the president and members of the Congress and uh, talking about one or another of his uh, 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 poverty program bills and in the middle of all that he'd reach into his pocket and he'd pull out my memo and he'd say I have this young man he's no different than any of you men he's he's no screaming liberal he's from Iowa and let me just read you a part of what he found and then he'd read it and just use it as a tool of persuasion uh, 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 which of course made me very proud and happy and that trip to the ghetto led as it often did with Lyndon Johnson to uh, uh, many other trips to the ghettos by me uh, six or seven or eight I don't remember how many each followed by a report and uh, uh, he liked it and uh, I thought I was doing something of use and I guess the other part of it that I thought was extremely useful was when I went into uh, the Philadelphia ghetto uh, again, it was a terribly cold and sleety night, uh, Sunday, and uh, the man who was escorting me, the black man who was escorting me, uh, introduced me to, uh, took me to church to see this uh, Reverend Leon Sullivan, 
who nobody had heard of at the time. And he was, the church I thought would be half empty because of the awful weather. It was just jammed. Sullivan was extraordinarily effective, a very charismatic man. And uh, uh, that wasn't the reason why I was being introduced to him. It was because Sullivan had this job training program called OIC, as I remember. And the next day, uh, 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 I spent the whole day with Reverend Sullivan. He showed me his job training program which was very, very impressive. And uh, uh, I came back to, to the White House and, uh, and, and, and actually strongly urged the president, if he, could all, if he could at all do it, to go to Philadelphia, into that ghetto, and meet Sullivan and, and, uh, and see what his, programs, what his program is, because I thought that was the way we ought to be going. And uh, the president bought that idea, and uh, the Secret Service did not want him to go into the ghetto. I remember that. He had to overrule the Secret Service. And anyway, he went in, met Sullivan, was impressed with Sullivan. Then we got back to Washington. He asked Sullivan to, uh, to, uh, to come to the White House, and he spent considerable time with Sullivan. And at the end of which, he called me in and Cliff Alexander, and he told uh, the two of us to go, go see Sergeant Shriver right now and tell Shriver to get this man some more money. And it was, uh, some, as I remember, it was like a Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, and Shriver, so we went out to the Shriver's house, and Shriver's having this big lawn party. <laughs> we called him out of the party and gave him the direction to get Sullivan money. Well, as, you, as the world now knows, Sullivan became a very, very famous fellow, and uh, I developed the Sullivan Principles, which were very, very important in, uh, in our relationship with South Africa. Went on the board of Chrysler Corporation, and uh, uh, I was very, very proud of that piece of uh, work for the president. You mentioned before you wanted me to uh, talk about two other incidents. One was what? Glassboro? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a uh, 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 the summit conference at Glassboro, New Jersey, in June 1967. There was a uh, that was just a couple weeks after the uh, uh, Six Day War uh, between Israel and the Arab nations, and uh, uh, Premier Kosygin of the Soviet Union was coming to speak to the United Nations. And uh, President Johnson wanted to take that opportunity to invite Kosygin down to Washington because he very much wanted uh, the Russians to uh, intervene with North Vietnam to bring him to the peace table. And so we extended the invitation to Kosygin, but Kosygin's response was that he's not visiting the United States, he's vid visiting the United Nations, and so it would not be proper for him might be appropriate for him to come to Washington. Rather, Johnson should come to the UN. Well, Johnson wasn't buying that either. Uh, and so it remained deadlocked like that for uh, uh, the better part of a day when somebody came up at the State Department, came up with an idea of, uh, of laying a string between uh, the White House and the United Nations headquarter and marking the point that's precisely halfway between it. And that happened to be Glassboro, New Jersey, which is the home of Glass, what was then known as Glassboro State Teachers College. And uh, uh, that proposal was accepted by uh, 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 the Russians. And uh, this was at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, and they agreed to meet at uh, right at, at 2 o'clock, I think, the next afternoon. And uh, uh, I was uh, then told to assemble a team, get on an airplane, and go uh, find a place for them to meet, make the place ready, and uh, have it all set by 2 o'clock the, uh, the next afternoon. So I, I had a plane load of Secret Service, State Departments, communications, press, you name it, Dick Moose, I remember from the National Security Council. Uh, and uh, we went up there and uh, uh, knocked on the door of the president of Glassboro State Teachers Co College, Dr. Robinson, 
and uh, by this time he knew we were coming because it did leaked out of the press but we didn't we told him I had a bunch of directions for the president about he wanted to have a large meeting room a place for lunch a place where they could meet privately and uh, we had to find a we had to find the locale so with the dr. Robinson we walked all over that campus and uh, uh, he kept suggesting the student union the auditorium this or that uh, classroom and uh, none of it. I knew right away the only place that we could do it was the Robinson's house and uh, uh, finally I, I, I did make that suggestion the Robinson's uh, reluctantly accepted it and we spent the whole night refurbishing that house so it wasn't it was a hot June day the house wasn't even air-conditioned it didn't have the power we, to be air conditioned, so we had to have the power company put in transformers. We had to buy uh, air conditioning units. We had to get new furniture. We had to get draperies. We had to get kitchen equipment. You can't believe what we went through, but we got it ready. And uh, at uh, at uh, just before Kosygin arrived, the president arrived in his helicopter and. Uh, got off of it and said to me, okay, now what am I supposed to do now? And I started rattling it off, and he said to me, I don't like it. And I said, but, stammered really, but, but Mr. President, Kosygin's going to be here in five minutes. And at that point, I always thought it was Mrs. Johnson, but it might have been Marvin. Somebody stepped between us and said, we have to do it Markman's way and he shrugged and we did and it went off fine and the, and the summit conference lasted for that day and then it reconvened two days later and uh, we have down in the uh, uh, first floor of this library uh, the uh, table and two chairs that they sat in and uh, which is in a story in itself which I'll briefly relate is the president wanted those for the library and directed me to go talk to Mrs. Robinson to buy them. And Mrs. Robinson said to me, well, Mr. Markman, you can have the chair and one of the, you can have the table and one of the chairs, but the other chair is a family heirloom and I don't want to give that away and I don't want to sell it. And I said, but we'll, I'll make sure that somebody duplicates it precisely. And she said, well, Mr. Markman, in that case, you take the duplicate and put it in the library. And I said, that isn't going to work, Mrs. Robinson. We want the real thing. In any event, she wouldn't give way, so I finally, in desperation, called uh, the governor of New Jersey, Hughes, and asked him if he would help, help, help. And he did, and she agreed, and now you have the table and the uh, uh, two chairs. And I think the other story you wanted me to, uh, incident you wanted to mention is uh, Williamsburg, which happened uh, later that same year. I think it was in October of 1967. The president was under great, great pressure at that time and, uh, the, and wanted to get away for a weekend and uh, a relaxation where he could uh, play golf with uh, Chuck Robb, who was about to be married to Linda, I think was married uh, the first week in December, uh, and generally wanted to relax, and uh, he wanted to do all that. Uh, oh, they were going to have the gridiron dinner, I think, on Saturday night in Williamsburg, and he was going to stay there, and then he wanted to go to church on Sunday. And so he sent me down there to um, find him a place to stay, which was, easy to do. The Rockefeller family actually owned that Williamsburg or controlled it and I called Governor Winthrop Rockefeller of Arkansas and uh, and I asked him uh, arranged for a place for the president to stay and the golfing and all of that and then mentioned church and he said well there's only one church that he should go to. There's one at Colonial Williamsburg called Bruton Parish. It's an Episcopal church and uh, uh, that's where he should attend and uh, being a, a foresightful young man, I said, but what about the minister? Uh, is he going to be okay? And the governor said, no problem about him. He's a great supporter of the president. No problem at all about him. Uh, 
nonetheless, I still being um, innately somewhat suspicious, I decided that maybe I ought to go chat with the minister myself. And I didn't want to do it myself, still mindful what, it, what risk I'd run with Senator Kennedy. I decided I would, should have a witness there and talk to one of the Secret Service agents, I think it was Clint Hill. Uh, and uh, uh, that there would be a, they agreed there might be a, a general, uh, be a security justification for the Secret Service to accompany me to talk to the minister because the president would be ch trapped in his church and all of that. So the two of us went to talk to the minister and I told him that the president is considering uh, coming to your church on Sunday and uh, uh, and we were just curious of what your sermon is going to be. Uh, and uh, he said, no problem with that. I happen to have a copy of it right here. You can look at it. You can see it's something that the president would very much uh, enjoy hearing. And uh, so we sat there and read it. And it was innocuous. Uh, uh, a good Episcopal sermon, if I ever read one in my life. And, uh, and uh, we thanked him and went back and I reported back to the president that all is in order and all is safe. Well, the president came down and the, uh, uh, and at the appointed time he went into the church with Mrs. Johnson and I stayed outside and uh, uh, about two minutes before the uh, uh, church uh, uh, service was over, the doors burst open, and all the press that was part of the press pool came running out, yelling, you never believe what just happened in there. And I knew instantly what had just happened in there. And I went, walked to the very end of this long motorcade <laughs> to try to hide myself. And the president walked out of the church, and I could see his face, and it was angry. And his eyes were just going all over the place. And he spotted me. And he went like this. And made me get in the car with him. Went back to the house. And he started berating me like uh, you have never heard about how incompetent, how stupid, uh, how careless I was how I'd been conned by this man. I tried to explain that I'd done everything I could possibly have done, looked at the, been assured. Oh, by the way, the, when the, right after the president walked out, the minister walked out and he had prepared copies of the sermon he had actually given. The one which had, oh, by the way, he had spent the sermon just berating the president on Vietnam. That's what had happened in there. And he had copies of it that he was handing out to the press. That's what uh, a false uh, man he had been. In any event, the president wouldn't hear of any of my explanations, nor would he stop, uh, uh, stop berating me for it. He went off to play golf. He directed me to stay there until he got back. When he got back, he continued on. Then I had intended to drive back to Washington with the Secret Service. He wouldn't let me do that. He made me fly back with him on the helicopter where he continued above the noise of the helicopter. When we got to the White House, I thought I could go home. He wouldn't permit that. Brought me up to the second floor of the mansion and continued it. Uh, I tried to quit, resign. He wouldn't hear of that. And uh, uh, the next morning I told Marvin, begged Marvin, what am I to do? He won't let me quit and he won't stop. He says, why don't you write a memo? Well, put it in his night reading. So I wrote a memo, he put it in his night reading. The president obviously read it because he initialed it. But, uh, and he never said another word. And this is typical of Lyndon Johnson. And he never apologized to me. Of course, as far as I know, Lyndon Johnson didn't apologize. Uh, but it wasn't maybe a week or 10 days later, I was invited to a White House party for a foreign head of state. And as you remember, you go through the receiving line. When they got to me, he put his arm around me, the president did, to the, whoever the head of state was and said, I just want you to meet one of the most brightest, most competent, most trustworthy assistants any president could ever add. At that moment, I, could, uh, I knew I'd been forgiven. 
which reminds me of the story. I know that uh, uh, Wilkins tells the story about the same kind of thing where he asked Wilkins after he used the N-word in Wilkins' presence. You've heard that story, I'm sure, that he asked Wilkins back in the Oval Office. He didn't apologize to him, but he s s talked about everything under the sun, but enough so that Wilkins knew that the President was sorry. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, <coughs> um, what was your uh, overall impression of President Johnson? I thought he was an extraordinary man, a prodigious memory, uh, the likes of which I have never um, ever seen. Uh, his ability to uh, communicate was extraordinary. I mean, he had a sense of uh, how to persuade people. As anyone who dealt with him knows, he had no uh, compunction against uh, invading your personal space. That famous picture of him, which is in your book, leaning over uh, Justice Fortas uh, is a great example. He holds you by the elbow or by the arm, uh, look down into you, get his face right next to you. He could communicate brilliantly uh, uh, in person, and not only just person to person uh, uh, or in a small group, but even in larger groups. There was just something about the electronic media that interfered with his ability to communicate and which, uh, as all of us know, endless efforts were made to try to solve that problem, all of which failed. He could not communicate through television. He just couldn't do it. And yet, uh, in person, the man was peerless. Uh, he, he preferred communicating that way, but uh, time being a very precious commodity to him, he uh, 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 so often used the telephone. People say he loved the telephone, and he did. He was very good on the telephone, and he did use it uh, uh, immensely, but he much, much preferred uh, uh, communicating uh, in person to a person. The advantage the telephone gave him was that he could cut somebody off. I mean, when it was over, it was over. Whereas if you're face to face with somebody, it could sometimes drag on. But I thought the man was a great man. His uh, uh, beliefs in his programs were totally his. Uh, his belief in his civil rights uh, program uh, goes back to his very roots. Uh, all of his speeches uh, 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 prove that. Uh, it's been said, and I think accurately so, that uh, in the field of civil rights he accomplished more than any president of the United States since Abraham Lincoln. And I think his belief in the uh, poverty program and his dream for uh, to have every American be able to have housing and education and a job was uh, came from his very soul. He believed that, uh, as he once said in one of his, I think it was his next to last speech that he gave in his lifetime, not the famous one here at the library, that uh, if his time on earth is to be judged, he would like it to be judged by the programs he saw enacted. Your own personal uh, uh, feeling?